Hey y'all, I'm Todd Clippard, preacher for the Burleson Church of Christ in Hamilton, Alabama. And thank you for joining us in this PTP 365 preteen class session. We're going to continue our study of being like Jesus from our study of 2 Timothy. Our study today is 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 23. I hope that you have your handout, your booklet. If you don't, you can get a hold of me and I'll be happy to. series and uh, probably more than I had anticipated presenting through the end of the year and I've determined today that we're going to finish this book if we have to go into January and and continue this study on into January whatever it takes we're going to continue uh, what I believe is a very important study the need to be like Jesus and so if you'll open your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy, we are in Lesson 5. Lesson 5, and the subject for our study today is Be Wise. <coughs> Be Wise. 2 Timothy 2, and in verse number 23, the Bible says, as always, reading from the New King James Version, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife. Now, this is a little bit of an aside from our normal procedure because the word be is not in the text. However, there's something we are told to avoid, and so even though there's no specific be, when it tells us not to be this, then we learn to be something else in this case the opposite and so as we look at our handout as we look at our handout we see um, that even though there's no B in the text we are told to avoid things associated with two ideas or two things what are those in verse 23 we are told to avoid things associated with foolishness and ignorance and so to be wise to be wise is to avoid both foolishness and ignorance. Now, the word, let me just make mention of one thing here real quick. The word ignorance is oftentimes used as a, um, a pejorative, a, an insult of sorts. Now, the word ignorance just simply means do not, you don't know. Uh, Paul used the term ignorance in uh, Acts 17 when he was talking about those that were worshiping the unknown God he said now the one whom you worship in ignorance is the one I'm about to declare to you and he wasn't condemning them as being stupid he just said you're worshiping something that you don't know there's an unknown God and I'm going to tell you who he is therefore when I finish with this you will not be ignorant you know a, a number of times Paul uses phrase or this statement, you know, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, about the things that happened uh, to me. And so the word itself is, is, is not, uh, it's not an insult, even though many times we use it as an insult. And so, we, but we want to avoid foolishness, and by the way, foolishness is an insult, biblically speaking, and we want to avoid ignorance. And the way that we do that is to be wise. And so let's look at some other uh, passages in our New Testaments that teach us about the need to be wise or things that we can do that are not wise. And then as we get down to the application at the bottom of the lesson, I'll add some more uh, texts uh, to our reading. And you can write those in, in in the space at the bottom there of page 7. And uh, in Matthew chapter 10, you have what is what is commonly referred to as the limited commission. Now, commission is a charge. It's a, a command. It's a job that's been, been given. And th this limited commission is called the limited commission because it is thought of in contrast with the great commission. Of course, we know that the Great Commission is what Jesus gave to the apostles just before he ascended into heaven 
You know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. Go and make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28 and verse 19. And that, that uh, the repentance and remission of sins will be preached among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Luke 24, 47. It's the Great Commission because it includes everybody in the world. Thus, the limited commission would not include everyone in the world. And we know from our reading of Matthew 10 and, and other places that this commission was limited to the Jews. And as Jesus is giving instruction to his, uh, his 70 to go out into this limited commission, he says to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. Be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. Now, this is um, an interesting statement, to say the least. Because the Bible doesn't have a lot of good things to say about snakes, serpents. I mean, the, our very first exposure to snakes or serpent is in Genesis chapter 3. It says the, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Uh, we have in no, the book of Numbers the fiery serpents. We have Moses, uh, his rod turning into a serpent. Uh, and must have been a bad one because he ran from it. And that, some, some of you say, well, I've run from any serpent. Well, I, and I understand that. I'm not one of those people, but many people are. You know, but the Bible doesn't have a lot of good things to say about serpents. And yet here's Jesus saying, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. So, you know, what, what could he possibly mean by that? And, you know, and as I think about it, um, you know, I'm struck, again, by the, by the use of serpents. But I think it has to do with the idea that, that serpents are generally considered to be somewhat... Um, I hate to use the word sneaky, uh, but they they have they they manage to appear in places without ever being seen. In other words, you know, most people don't see a serpent from afar off and recognize it. You know, a serpent you know manages to be right under your feet. Uh, you know, you you lift up you know you lift up something out in the grass or out somewhere. You kick over a log, and there he is, and. And, and so this idea of being able to maneuver and get around and, 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 and move about it in, a, in an inconspicuous way is identified with being wise. And, so, and also knowing how, knowing how to do certain things is, for example, you know, the serpent knew how to trick or to deceive Eve. Uh, Paul talked about, you know, as, as the serpent deceived Eve, I fear that you are also in danger of being deceived in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And so, you know, we have to, we have to be on guard against the wiles of the devil. In other words, the devil is... ...surroundings and, and be wise to accomplish what you want to and need to accomplish. But then it says to be harmless as doves. And so there you have the opposite, the opposite of the idea of a serpent. That, you know, serpents are, were generally regarded to be, to be deadly. Uh, as one uh, lady told me from church one time, she called me to go to her house. And she said, there's a big old snake out here behind my house. I need you to come get it. So I went and I went to go. I was either going to go catch it or kill it. And didn't know what it was. And, and so when I, I got out there and it was just a big old chicken snake. It was about five, six feet long. And uh, I said, Nellie, I said, I said, this snake's not going to hurt you. She said, maybe not, but he'll make me hurt myself. And so, you know, the, 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 the idea that a snake maybe is not harmless, even if he intends you no harm. So we're to be harmless as doves. You know, doves are a symbol of peace. And so there's, there's a way that we are to be wise about our surroundings and the, the job that we are, uh, be, that we've been given by God. And then there's also the means by which we don't want to do any harm to people. You know, a dove is a very soft, you know, a very soft bird. It's not a bird of prey. It doesn't, you know, 
it doesn't feed on other animals um, and uh, you know as you know a dove lights you know on the ground or on a tree you know very very softly very uh, gently and so we're to be wise but we're also to be gentle and so Jesus tells us that, that, that our wisdom needs to be exercised within the context of gentleness. Uh, then number three, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, Paul speaks of those who, who were undermining his authority as an apostle. And he says, they comparing themselves with themselves are not wise. In other words, they they used the wrong people, or let me put it this way, they used the wrong standard to judge their value and their uh, validity as teachers. You know, and, and this is a very dangerous thing. To go to our question, 2 Corinthians 10, 12 teaches that when we compare ourselves to others, we are not wise. Now, why is that the case? Why is it? the case that I should not compare myself to others. Well, because others are not the standard. You know, the, the only standard I have is the standard of Christ and, and the teaching of Christ. And of course, Jesus lived to the standard that he taught. And so my standard is Jesus. Also, you know, we see people that may at times be struggling in their faith and we could tend to look down on them in their time of weakness, and we have no idea what's going on in their lives. We have no idea what's going on at home, and for older folks, we have no idea what's going on uh, at work. You know, family troubles, you know, financial troubles, just uh, troubles with friends, and so when people appear to be struggling to be weak. If we compare ourselves to them when we ourselves are not facing any type of difficulty, then we get a false sense of superiority. We get a false sense of security uh, with regard to, to um, our level of faithfulness. And so we want to be careful. We've got to be on guard that we do not compare ourselves or make false comparisons uh, with regard to others. And, so, and if we do that, we are not wise. Let me give you, just give you an example. Um, you know, from the time I was a, a young boy, our, my home congregation had what we called young men's training classes. And we would, we would gather together, we would study, and we would learn how to preach, and learn how to pray, and learn how, and, and learn how to, really, to learn how to read publicly. You know, there's more to, to public scripture reading than just, than just reading. And, um, you know, and we never, you know, we never considered anybody being better than anyone else. And, but sometimes people will do that. But the reason I mention that is I have never, ever been afraid to talk to people. All of my life, it did look, it didn't matter where I was or who I was with. I could be right at home. You know, with a group of people I, I've never been with. I've, I've been all around the world. I mean, literally, I've, well, not all around the world. I've been, I've been to Europe. I've been to Africa a number of times. And I've been in a lot of different situations in Africa and in Europe. And, and, and I never feel ill at ease. Now, that's got nothing to do with me. That's just, that's just the personality that God gave me. There are other people that are shy. They're, they're introverts. And, and, and they do not like people looking at them. You know, they don't want to be the focus or the center of attention. So with that in mind, let's consider what if during this young man's training class, which I always, I was always one of the preachers. You know, we always had our little, you know, short lessons that we did. I was always one of the preachers. Why? It didn't bother me to speak in front of people. I wanted to. All right. So. You know, what you know, what was really a greater what was really a, a greater accomplishment me who had no fear of people or crowds or public speaking getting up and delivering my five minute talk or someone who was terrified of being in front of people getting up and reading a text from the Bible to what at that time was a fairly considerable audience you know over 300 people you see you think well well 
well, he he did so much better. I mean, he he's he preached, and all he did was stand up and read two or three verses. But you know, but what was the real accomplishment? The real accomplishment was in the person who overcame his fear. And so again, that would be you know, if you were saying, well, I'm going to compare this one because he preached against this one just because all he did was read, or all he did was read a closing prayer or something like that. Bad comparison. Because it wasn't anything for me to get up and do what I did. And I know a lot of young guys that, that really, really struggled. And people to the, today still struggle with those exact same things. And so that's why we have to be careful about, about comparisons. Uh, you know, one guy might get up and just read eloquently. And, and he gets all of his words right. And, and it's just, a, it's just a, 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 a tremendous reading. Next guy gets up and he stummer, stammers and stutters and, and, and mumbles. And, and, and he just struggles. But he gets through. You know, that's the guy that's really done something. That's the guy that's really done something. You know, and we want to we want to hold up. You know, we want to hold up every good thing uh, that goes on, especially within the confines of the church. And we don't want to compare ourselves to others with regard to our abilities or uh, what we perceive to be our own personal level of faithfulness or piety. And so we don't want to make false comparisons. All right, now, in Ephesians chapter 5, we're at question 4. In Ephesians chapter 5, let me get my Bible pulled back here so I can, so I can turn over there. We're going to read verses 14 and 15. I mean, excuse me, 15 and 16. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. It says, and actually, let's go ahead and let's include verse 17 because it goes with our theme. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil therefore do not be unwise but understand what the will of the lord is so we look at this text and we learned that that we can avoid being foolish by doing two things and what are those things to walk circumspectly and to redeem the time in other words understand the value of time to walk circumspectly means to, to walk with awareness and not carelessly. Um, you know, it, it just takes a moment of carelessness to... to um, you know, not being aware of our surroundings. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, sidewalks are not level. And, um, and so, you know... We want to walk with an awareness of what's going on so that we don't stumble. And then we're to redeem the time. You know, as young people, you know, we think we have our whole lives ahead of us. And you know what? Chances are we do. The chances are that we do have our, our whole lives ahead of us. You know, if you're watching this and you're 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, however old you are, you're a young person, you think... Man, I've got 60 or 70 years, 80 years ahead of me. And, you know, maybe you even lived 100, and I've got all this time ahead of me. And uh, there's no need to get in a rush about serving the Lord. i got plenty of time for that. i got plenty of time to, to start reading my Bible later on. And that's not redeeming the time. Number one, we really don't know how much time we have. You know, none of us, none of us know how much time we have. You know, David made a statement. He said, there is but a step between me and death. You know, and that's true for us basically every day. You, know, you walk along the side of the street, you walk on a sidewalk of a, of a busy road, uh, you cross the street, you get in a car. Uh, you, you know, there's, there's uh, in a moment's time, in a moment's time, our lives can be snatched from us. And I don't say that to scare anybody, but just to help us to be wise, to understand that that the there may or may not be as much time as we think. And so therefore, we want to treat every day uh, with great respect. We want to treat every day, every moment as a gift from God. And we want to, we want to be preparing ourselves and, and to be found uh, diligent in obeying and developing ourselves uh, within the will of and the teaching of, of God and the Bible, and so as we as we think about redeeming the time, we want to be we want to be faithful young people. Um, we want 
you know, we need our young people to represent what the Lord's Church is and what it believes and how it acts. And so we want to redeem the time. That's, that's exercising wisdom. Now, turn back, if you would, to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. John, chapter 9, because our, our, our purpose is to, to learn to be like Jesus. And so it's about time, to, you know, it's about time for us to look and see what Jesus has to say about this matter of redeeming the time and being wise. And, and Jesus said here in John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, okay? John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, he says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. And as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So we learn here that Jesus was concerned about time. He was a time-conscious individual. He, he, he understood. Now look, I want you to think about this. Jesus did not begin his public ministry until he was about 30 years old. 30 years old. And then he died less than four years later. So all of this time... This 30 years had been spent in preparation for a very narrow window to get done, to accomplish what God had sent him to do. What God had sent him to do. And so Jesus understood that he had a limited amount of time. Now, of course, Jesus knew ahead of time how much time he had. We understand that. But the point of the matter is Jesus knew what he had to accomplish, and how little time he had to accomplish it. Now, there were times when Jesus was preaching in places and people loved to hear him. They wanted him to teach. They wanted him to stay. But he said, look, I can't stay. I've got to, I've got to go over here and preach. You know, I've, got to give, I've got to give the message to, to the folks down the road here at this next town. You know, as much as I, you know, and it doesn't say this, but it's like, you know, as much as I'd love to stay here and, 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 and speak to people who want me to be here and they want me to stay, there's other, there are other people, there are other people who have to hear this message. You know, I don't have, I'd love to stay, but I don't have the time. There's too much to do and so little time, or there's so much to do and so little time uh, in which to do it. And so Jesus was time conscious. We should be time conscious. I, I don't mean like, look, I don't like being late. I don't like it when people are late. There are people who are habitually late. Um, they're going to be late to their own funeral. You know, you know, there, there are, there are a handful of people that I can, I can tell you, I can tell you every single Sunday, just about every single Sunday night or Wednesday night, I can tell you Who's going to be there about seven minutes after we get started? All right, I, and I, you know, I'm time conscious in that respect. But when I say we need to be time conscious, what I mean is about our time to do the will of God. We need to be time conscious. Look, even if we were all to live to be a hundred, James still describes our life as a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, I look back at my life, I'm 53 years old, you know, and, and I've got grown children, I've got grandchildren. And then when I think about that, you know, and time just gets faster. I, look, I know technically it doesn't, but time just gets faster and faster and faster and faster, and it gets away faster and faster and faster. And because and because of that I I want to be time conscious. You know, I know there's you have to take time to relax. You need time to for, for vacation and and to relax the mind and and rest the body. But but you know we need to be we need to be diligent in our service, our work for the Lord, no matter how old or young that we might be. We want to be time. We want to be time conscious. By the way. And I didn't put this, but you could add this to the why section under question seven. Why should we be time conscious? Because we don't know how much time the rest of the world has. We already said we don't know how much time we have. You know, what if I was 20 years old, but you know, my 20 year old friend, he didn't have as much time as I did, and he's not a Christian. And so I want to be, I want to be mindful of the fact it's not just a matter of how much time I have. 
sometimes it's a matter of how much time others have as well. And so we want to be diligent in the work of God. Uh, question 8 in James 1 verses 5 through 8, and we don't have time to read this text. Um, and so um, I want you to read it on your own, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and give you the answers. It says, what does James tell us to do if we lack wisdom? It says, if any man lack, lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. And it says, we are to ask, let him ask in faith without wavering. It says, man. Stable, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And so we want, we want to ask the Lord in faith concerning my, my computer monitors played out on me. I got dark there for a minute. And so we want to ask in faith. Now, again, because of the constraints of time, I want you to look at Proverbs 1, 8 to 19 on your own. Proverbs 19, 26, and 27 on your own and answer these questions now that are there now with regard to question number three about who are others that we should listen to or look to for wisdom and guidance all right i want you to write down these verses and then we'll close write down these verses hebrews just write h-e-b h-e-b hebrews 13 verse 7 and verse 17 ephesians 6 Verses 1 through 4. EPH 6, 1 through 4. Colossians, C-O-L, 3, verse 21 and following. Psalm, P-S, 119, verse 9. And also Psalm 19. And those are some great texts to teach us where we need to go and look uh, for the wisdom that God would have us uh, to possess. All right, our time is gone. Thank you so much for, for being with us in our, our Bible study today. The Lord wills, we'll be back uh, next week with uh, additional material on Lesson 6 on page 8. And I hope that we'll see you then. Until next time, I'm Todd Clifford. Have a great day and great rest of your week.